So um, I'm going to suggest that we move on to um, uh, lumbar spondylolisthesis and spondylosis. Um, and I'll let you carry on. Thank you. Okay. All right. Great. So this will be, um, um, so this is covering lumbar spondylolisthesis and uh, spondylolisthesis. So uh, spondylolysis is a defect of the pars interarticularis. So the pars inter interarticularis is a segment of the bone that um, connects um, the uh, superior uh, uh, articular process to the inferior articular process of that vertebra. And it's one of the most commonest causes of back pain in the adolescent. And uh, it's most commonly seen in adolescents who are very active um, especially in hyperextension sports such as gymnasts or um, or other athletes involved in lots of extension activities. Incidence is between 4.4 and 6% and the L5 vertebral body is the most commonly affected. Um, there's different types of spondylolysis. So ismic type is the most common and is attributed to a stress fracture of the pass from repeated hyperextension. The dysplastic type is less common and is caused by congenital deficiency of the inferior facets of L5 and or the superior facets of S1 and elongation of the pars. Uh, in terms of diagnosing, um, a plain lateral x-ray is difficult for diagnosis. So an oblique x-ray creates what's called the Scotty dog view. And the pars intercularis is um, seen as a line across the neck of the dog or the collar. So you can see on that radiograph, there's a uh, lytic area across the neck of that dog, and that is the um, uh, pars defect. Um, MRIs can also be used, but they have a, um, they're not as accurate as a CT in terms of diagnosing a pars defect. And a SPECT CT is uh, quite useful in, in managing a pars defect, as it can see as increased uptake suggests that this is an active defect uh, which has a potential to heal, whereas one with little uptake suggests that it is a cold lesion which may not heal. And all of this will help you with uh, uh, planning your management of a patient with a pars defect. Uh, generally, when you see a patient with uh, uh, back pain and diagnosis of pars defect, you manage them with analgesia. If they're quite active, you would advise a trial of activity restriction, refer them to see a physiotherapist. And quite often, I would brace them as well. So a trial of bracing for about three months. And this actually has quite a high success rate. Um, if despite conservative measures, they continue to have pain, which uh, causes um, disability for them, again, I would get further imaging, CT scan or a SPECT CT scan. And if it does, um, if they still have ongoing pain, I would then also get an MRI scan also, um, because an MRI scan is important for me to look at the disc space. So if it's an L5 uh, pars defect, I want to look at the um, uh, <clears throat> I want to look at the uh, disc space um, to see if there's any degeneration. If there's no disc degeneration and there's no significant slippage of one vertebral body on the other, I would consider a direct pars repair. Whereas if there's evidence of disc degeneration or a um, listhesis of greater than grade one, I would consider a lumbar fusion. So this is an example of a direct repair. So this patient has a L4 pars defect, and I got an MRI uh, prior to surgery, and it showed that there was no evidence of disc degeneration at L4, L5. And also this patient had no anterolisthesis at L4, L5. So this was a candidate for a direct pars repair. Moving on to spondylolisthesis. So with regards to spondylolisthesis, you've got to know the classification. This is the Wiltsey and Newman classification, which dis, uh, divides spondylolisthesis into type one, which is dysplastic type. Type two, isthmic type. Type three is degenerative. Um, so isthmic is when you've got pars defect and it causes the um, uh, subluxation. Dysplastic is when you've got abnormalities such as an elongated pars which then uh, leads to the listhesis. Uh, type three is degenerative, which you see in the more 
older population where you've got wear and tear of the facet joints and of the capsule that causes the sliding of, across the facet joints and the spondylolisthesis. Traumatic associated with fractures, so you can get traumatic fract uh, pars fractures or pedicle fractures, which then cause the listhesis and pathologic, which could essentially be associated with infection or tumors. Uh, the maiden classification uh, will classify you uh, in terms of the severity of the slippage. Um, so grade one is up to a, um, so you break up the uh, superior end plate of the, uh, this say at L5S1 of the vertebral body below into four quadrants. So grade one is a slippage of approximately 25%. Grade two is up to 50%. Grade three is up to 75%. Grade four is when it's just hinging at the edge. And grade five is spondyloptosis when it completely comes off the um, end plate below. So when to consider surgery. So um, these patients will quite often present with back pain, but also with leg pain symptoms as well. So if you've got a, say an L5 S1 slip, as the L5 vertebral body slips forward, it will compress the L5 foramen L5 nerves coming out of the L5 foramen as the L5 vertebral body slips over S1, and then they will get bilateral L5 radiculopathy. Um, so the patients with, um, say, a lytic spondylolisthesis, the younger population, they are more likely to get the foraminal stenosis as one vertebral body slips over the other. The degenerative patients, the older patients, they are more likely to have central stenosis because there's more of a degenerative process over a long time. So they'll have the flavor hypertrophy and the more central stenosis. So they'll present more with symptoms of neurogenic claudication rather than um, foraminal radiculopathy. Uh, they may present with neurological deficits. They could present with foot drops um, as the L L5 nerve root gets compressed from an L5 S1 spondylolisthesis. Uh, or they may get symptoms from uh, sagittal imbalance, uh, so increased back pain, fatigue. Um, um, and so you consider surgery when you, uh, when you try all uh, non-operative measures with analgesia, physiotherapy. Um, and despite all of that, um, 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 they still have symptoms. You can consider surgery or you consider surgery if they have acute neurological deficits. Another indication for surgery would be slip progression. Um, so another uh, question you may get asked in, um, during your examination is, when would you fix these um, 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 listhesis in situ as they are, and when would you reduce them? So there's an, uh, you don't necessarily need to know this classification, but this is a more up-to-date classification of spondylolisthesis, and it helps you guide which ones to fix in situ and which ones to reduce. So in this classification, uh, essentially, um, um, if you've got a spondylolisthesis, which is low grade, generally, which is either grade one or grade two, you could uh, fix them in situ. It's not necessary to reduce them. When you have high-grade spondylolisthesis, you have to determine whether this is a balanced, a balanced spine and pelvis or not. And if it's a balanced spine and pelvis, you could do an in situ fusion. If there is compensation, if the pelvis is compensating for the imbalanced spine with the retro, retroverted pelvis, then you should uh, more consider a partial reduction in fusion. A complete reduction is a more riskier option simply because um, the nerve is used to being in a certain position. And if you over reduce it, you could injure that nerve and that could re uh, result in permanent neurological injury and foot drops. So when we're talking, so an important part about uh, deciding whether to reduce or to non-reduce is whether it's a low grade or a high grade slip. And if it's a high grade slip, you have to decide whether it is a if, if the patient is balanced or not balanced. And when we're talking about balanced or non-balanced, we're asking is the pelvis uh, and is the body compensating for an unbalanced, unbalanced spine? So when we're talking about balance, sagittal balance, um, there's certain terms that we should know, such as the pelvic incidence. 
So pelvic incidence is an angle that's measured. So you draw a line from the center of the femoral head to the midpoint of the sacrum, another line from the midpoint of the sacrum perpendicular to the sacral uh, to the sacrum. And that angle between these two lines is the pelvic incidence, which is a fixed angle for each individual. This has a quite a big range, but most often is between 50 and 55 degrees. And this does not change during a patient's lifetime. Um, and another important thing is lumbar lordosis, which is usually measured from L, L, uh, L1 to S1. And usually, if you have a balanced spine, the lumbar lordosis and the um, pelvic incidence should be similar or 5 to 10 degrees away from each other. So when there's a big mismatch between the pelvic incidence and the lumbar lordosis, it comes to your mind that maybe this is, there is an imbalance in the sagittal balance of this patient. Other um, things to measure are the sacral slope. So you draw a line, uh, a horizontal, horizontal line from the posterior corner of the sacrum and measure that to the sacral end plate. And you also measure the pelvic tilt. So a vertical line straight up from the midpoint of the fem femoral head and another line to the midpoint of the sacral end plate. And that angle is a uh, pelvic tilt. So the pelvic incidence is a combination of the pelvic tilt and the sacral slope. Pelvic tilt value is normally between 11 and 15 degrees. And it's a very important indicator, indicator of pelvic retroversion. So when you're having a pelvic tilt above 15 degrees, you know that the pelvis is compensating by retroversion for a abnormal shaped spine. And when you see these compensation measures, that's when you start thinking, perhaps I should think about reducing this spine rather than just fixing it inside you. So when the spine is imbalanced with, uh, say for example, spondylolisthesis, the body compensates by pelvic retroversion by knee flexion, ankle extension, reducing thoracic, uh, thoracic kyphosis, and also flexing the hip as well. So you'll see all, a patient walk in with an imbalanced spine, with knees flexed, hips flexed, um, and just trying to keep themselves upright. Um, the advantage of reducing the uh, spondylolisthesis and fixing it is that you get a better restoration of sagittal balance. Um, you get higher union rates and better perennial decompression. And the potential disadvantages are increased risk of neurological injury. And uh, all of the neurological injury is most often temporary. Another thing you may get asked about in your vivers or clinical stations is about what happens, uh, what do you do with spondyloptosis. So you should probably just have an idea that this uh, uh, such a thing as a GAINS procedure for spondyloptosis where essentially you can see in this diagram where L5 is completely fallen off anteriorly from the sacrum. And in such a procedure, you enter anteriorly and you completely remove the L5 vertebral body and then you reduce uh, the L4 vertebral body onto the sacrum and fix it from posteriorly. So you go anteriorly uh, as the first stage and the second stage you go posteriorly and reduce L4 on the sacrum and fix it there. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, again, that was another excellent lecture and um, you know, a really good summary of what you need to know and what you need to demonstrate um, when you're in your exams. Um, <clears throat> certainly when I was doing my exams, those issues of pelvic incidence and things, I had struggled to get my head around that. So again, I'd suggest you watch um that lecture again just to revise your knowledge so we've had a couple of questions um we've got one from kalish who asks what type of brace would you use in spondylosis spondylosis well i mean you could either use a uh, uh usually i use a lumbar brace some people just use a lumbar corset or you can actually use a more harder brace um, um um, like a poly jacket, like a polycarbon type brace. So, um, you know, um, I usually use a kind of a harder brace just to reduce their act, uh, um, stop movement uh, as much as possible. And I think the most important thing is the activity restriction. 
Um, so you generally find that once they stop doing their sports and a period of rest, it makes a huge difference. Thank you. Uh, we've got a question from Jensen. He's asked, is neuromuscular scoliosis further classified into an upper motor neuron lesion and a lower motor neuron lesion, as in spastic versus paralytic type? Um, so it, it's br broken down into, yes, um, uh, neuropathic and myopathic. And then you break it down into upper motor neuron and also lower motor neuron, which is either, yeah, either, either you know, the classic signs of upper motor neuron with the spasticity or low motor neuron where you've got the more flaccid paralysis, yes. Thank you. Uh, I've got a question from Chinyik. Um, what physiotherapy do you recommend to a patient with spondylosis? So again, it's... Um, um, core mu it's basically core muscle strengthening exercises to help, uh, to help offload um, the pressures going through the spine. So build up your paraspinal muscles, the gluteals, and the upper back as well to help divert forces away from the lower back. Thank you. And uh, the last question um, we've got from Abdullah. What is the difference between a PLIF and a posterior fusion? Uh, so a pliff and a posterior fusion. So uh, when you're fusing the uh, degenerative spine, um, you, in terms of instrumented fusion, you can just have what's called a posterolateral instrumented fusion, which just means putting, say at L4-5, just putting pedicle screws in both sides. Then you decorticate the facets and the transverse processes and just put some bone graft at the back. So there you're just trying to get fusion around the back. With a posterior lumbar interbody fusion, that means you're putting your screws and everything else, but you also need to take off a bit of the lamina, get into the disc space, take out the disc, and then put a cage in filled with bone graft. And here you're trying to get fusion across the, um, um, uh, across the disc space anteriorly. So a posterior lateral instrumented fusion or a posterior instrumented fusion, you're trying to get fusion only through the back. When you're doing a posterior lumbar interbody fusion, you're going trying to get fusion around through the front, through the disc space, using a cage. Okay, that's fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, so what we'll move on to now is the polling question with the MCQ questions. So um, Ruth will share the polling questions with you and if you just answer the questions and we'll see how well you've been listening. Mr. Altaf, would you like to um, comment on the questions and the answers, please? Yeah, sure. So the first question was, um, in infantile, scoliosis, uh, infantile idiopathic scoliosis, which of the following uh, factors uh, suggested progression? So the options were age at presentation, um, rib overlap of the apical vertebra, rib vertebral angle difference of greater than 15 degrees, and male gender. So, um, so when you answer most of these questions, you have to some more than one question could be correct. So, which factors suggest progression? So, clearly, age at progression could suggest it as well. But, but you have to. That's not an incorrect answer on its own. Um, the last one, male gender. Um, uh, male. It's more more predominant male gender, but it's not a factor that would predict progression. Rib vertebral angle difference of greater than 15 degrees. Uh, uh, the threshold is actually 20 degrees, so that's not correct. Um, so the correct answer, which, uh, which is the majority uh, you, you've answered, is number two, which is the rib overlap of the apical vertebra. So that, um, if you remember that slide on the um, phase of the rib, so that would be phase, the rib phase two. Um, so that would be the rib phase two, where you've got the overlap of the apical vertebra on the convex side. So that's the correct answer. And well done. Most of you got that right. Um, the second one, um, the question was in patients with adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. Um, BRACIC is indicated in which of the following conditions? Um, I can't seem to see the last option on my thing. Um, so you can just scroll down, Farhan, on the right-hand yeah. side. You can just on the polling. You should be able to scroll down. Yeah, I can't seem to do that. So, uh, what was the percentage for the last answer in two? Sixty. 
Sixty percent. Okay. So, um, so for this, the answer. So for this question, um, so the first answer was any patient with a curve greater than twenty-five degrees. Um, so that's not correct. So if a patient has, say, the patient is RISA four, RISA five, uh, he's finished growth, so they don't require um, bracing. Uh, what about a girl who's RISA four with a curve of thirty degrees? Okay, 30 degrees is worrying. You may consider bracing, but it's RISA 4. So the growth is pretty much finished. So there's no point bracing this patient. 11-year-old boy with a core angle of 50 degrees. Uh, well, he's already beyond the threshold for bracing. So curves 45 degrees or more, you do not brace because the, uh, this patient should be considered for surgery. And um, looks like most of you have got the correct answer, which is a pre girl with a cob angle of um, 30 degrees. Again, 30 degrees is a worrying number, especially uh, when it's pre um, because uh, that means that she's still going to approach a growth spurt. So this patient may actually end up requiring surgery um, um, despite the bracing. Question three, congenital anomalies or vertebral column are frequently associated with organ system problems. In addition to x-rays of the spine, what other screening tests should you be ordered? So the first answer is spine, MRI, and coagulation profile. That's incorrect because a coagulation profile would not be too helpful. Second answer, renal ultrasound, upper and lower GI. That's again a very vague answer. What does that mean, upper and lower GI? Third answer, renal ultrasound, cardiac evaluation, echocardiogram, spinal MRI. Um, that is the correct answer because um, congenital um, scoliosis is associated with renal abnormalities in up to 40%, cardiac abnormalities in up to 10%, and also um, MRI abnormalities up to 35%. The last answer is incorrect um, because, again, it, 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 it talks about upper and lower GI, which is not very specific. I can't see the answers for that. What was the uh, 83%. majority answer? 83%. Yeah, number the three. third one. Yeah. All right, good. Excellent. Well done, everyone. That's great. I'll stop sharing now. Back to you, uh, Nicola. Thank you. Um, thank you everyone for answering the um, MCQ questions. Um, what we're going to do now is we're going to move on to the Vive.